Good morning, everybody. So I'm Tom Green. I'm here from Couchbase. Um, so a bit of background on myself. So I work and I'm based in London. Um, and I work with our customers on the technical side of working with our product. So I work on evaluations, proof of concept, helping people tune their code, and in particular, helping people model their data so that it will work best and be scalable um, for building new and um, exciting applications. So my background before Couchbase, um, I did quite a bit of time working in um, dynamic compilers, but more related to Couchbase on clustered systems, in particular IBM and Intel, around uh, large-scale systems like GPFS and the SAN volume controller in the storage space. Um, but before we get started, I just want to say big thanks to TNG for inviting us to come and speak here today um, at the Big Tech Day and talk about big data. Um, and the focus in particular I want to concentrate on is the real-time interactive portion of big data. It's a very, very hot topic, big data, and that means there's a lot of hype around it. And sometimes it's difficult to navigate through that hype and really get to the actual piece of what's the technology here that can help us, what are the business problems it can solve, and what are the technical problems it actually solves for us as well. So we'll try and look into those pieces and see how it fits in with other big data technologies as well. So if we look back and we go to sort of the, the outset of the, you know, the, the dot-com internet kind of age, um, there was a digital economy emerging, and, and a lot has changed then, since then. The number of end users has been changing, and the kinds of companies that have been involved uh, is changing. And what you see is a lot of the companies on this side of the slide here, people like LinkedIn, people like eBay, people like Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, these are the companies that really first started to struggle and tackle these challenges. These were the kinds of companies that were the first people in the world to have a billion users, the first people to have millions of people actively using their service at the same point in time. And they, being very, very technology-focused companies, you know, a lot of sort of Silicon Valley type companies in there, um, they built their own solutions to try and solve these problems. So they internally developed new technologies, particularly database type technologies, that allowed them to scale in a way which their existing technologies like MySQL, like Oracle, just wasn't enabling them to do. So you started to see an emergence there of these new technologies used internally within those companies, some of which were open source, some of which were proprietary and internal. Um, and then over time, you start to see more of the companies on the right-hand side start to have those kind of same challenges. People like supermarkets and shopping supermarkets, people like airlines, people like car hire companies, um, financial firms, they got bigger web presences. They started to do more of their selling through their dot-com website. And they were going from having maybe tens of thousands of active users spread throughout their stores to potentially having very large numbers of active users on their website, and even more increasingly, through mobile channels. So now those companies on the right-hand side have started to struggle with the same challenges about data volume and about how to handle and, and deal with that. And then a, a, a number of technology companies sprung up, including Couchbase um, and a couple of our competitors, Cassandra, MongoDB, on the sort of NoSQL side of things, Hadoop on the sort of big data analytics side of things, to form open source technologies with commercial offerings around that to help companies actually solve the same kinds of problems that these out and out tech firms had already been dealing with for a number of years. And we've seen this growth accelerating in terms of the kind of companies doing these things and particularly moving to cloud environments. As people move from a traditional in-house data center and move to a cloud environment, the expectations of how that infrastructure should be used and dealt with are quite different. And you see a lot of these come up in talks at other sessions today, I'm sure, where people are talking about how do we rapidly deploy, how do we build our apps to be agile, how do we build our apps so that they can scale on the fly. And these are all things that you want to take advantage of because you're in the cloud, you can grow your resources, you can shrink your resources as demand, um, you know, as your customer demand requires. So you see a lot of companies here, these are people like, you know, Salesforce, kind of one of the pioneers in terms of software as a service um, with their own internal cloud solutions. But then people like Concur who do expenses, Intuit, so they do TurboTax, so that's what, you know, the majority of people in the US use for filing their tax returns. Um, and then, you know, sort of gaming type companies that might have traditionally run their services in-house, them themselves moving into the cloud with people like Disney and EA and so on. And we see this across the board, people taking their internal applications as they move them to, a, to the cloud, 
often seeing that as an opportunity where they need to re-architect things to take advantage of that. So what do we actually mean? You know, what kind of scale are we talking about in terms of big data here? Well, we really are talking about billions of potential users, hopefully not all simultaneously at the same time, but there really are billions, you know, for, for some of these companies to have billions of users, there are billions of people online. It's perfectly feasible at this point in time for that to happen. Um, you, know, you only have to think about consumer electronics companies you know, offering mobile phones. You know, some of those people have 800 million and a billion user accounts registered with them. And, you know, billions of devices. We talk about the number of users, but most users these days have multiple devices. They have their laptop, their mobile phone, their tablet. All of these things need to react, uh, be able to interact via the different channels. And we're spending increasing amounts of time online, more and more hours per day, either at work, hopefully doing work online, um, but maybe not so much, and, you know, also at home for our leisure time as well. Um, so all of these things, the net result of them is obviously masses and masses of more data that has to be dealt with. So I think the Z there is stands for a zettabyte, so um, I think that's 5.5 zettabytes of data out there in 2014, and you can see this graph just goes up and up and up. So what we're seeing is that there's, because of these changes in the world out there in terms of this online demand, it's making different demands on technology. The huge increase in the number of users, the explosion in data quantities, is coupled with increased user expectations. Users expect applications that are fast and responsive. They don't expect to stand there in a shop at a till waiting for the system to respond. They don't expect to be on a website waiting for a page to load. They want a fast and very, very interactive application. They also have an expectation for personalized experience when they first go on to a particular site. Um, their expectation is that it's custom and ta tailored to their needs. Uh, again, this is something Amazon pioneered very, very well. When you go to Amazon.com, they're going to show you the things that you're interested in. If you're in technology, you're going to get technology books, technology items focused and pushed to you, very different to somebody in a different sector. And people have that expectation. They don't want to be seeing things on the website that are of no interest to them. They want to be showing the things that matter to them. And then people have this... this desire that they, they, they feel that things should improve quicker. You know, they want mobile phone applications that update and have newer features that allow them to keep using the application. They want websites which constantly get better on a, a pretty fast cycle. So we've seen this change from where you would have very long release cycles and you'd release perhaps maybe once a quarter or often even maybe only twice a year where you deploy to production. That changing where people want much shorter release cycles, this plays into the cloud model, it plays into the deployment models. People talk about these new technologies like Chef, Puppet, Docker, all enabling this, this ability to change faster. And I think we see that even, you know, and this is a big indicator, that even Microsoft with the latest version of Windows are moving from a release very occasionally kind of model to actually these very quick regular releases. So even at the kind of Microsoft Windows kind of level, there's that changing model and changing expectations for improvements in products. So how, how can systems provide personalized experience? How can you iterate to release quickly and maintain responsiveness? There's some of the challenges that are pushing down on the traditional IT stacks. And this is kind of comes in and what are the kinds of things that people might use something like NoSQL for? And I've just put a flavor of some of the kinds of things up here. Certainly one of the big topics is profile management. Your user profile, so this is your, your name, your address, your personalized system settings, um, what accounts you're registered with, your credit card details. So this is your, your classic kind of user profile that has the information about what services you actually um, have and are uh, entitled to. So a common, you know, one common use case for this is online TV streaming. Um, Premier League football, um, you log on to watch the video streaming, they have to check, have you actually paid for the package that includes Premier League, or do you only have the movies package? So that's used by Sky pretty heavily um, for those kind of use cases. And then there's the personalization aspect that I mentioned. This is how do you tailor the website based on the information in their user profile and the data you've been capturing to make sure they have a unique experience. 360-degree customer view, you know, a lot, of, a lot of businesses have a challenge with their customer data that is very, very siloed, either because it was built up in separate departments many years ago or because it was 
brought in from companies that they acquired and they had their own customer records. And they like to put an aggregation layer on top where they can pull the data from all these different systems together and have a single place to actually access the customer data. Now, I think a classic example of this is, is, is banks. You go to the bank and the current account is on one system. You have a credit card with the same bank and you know, that has a completely different record of your name and address because it's in a different IT system. So when somebody in customer service wants to know about this customer and they've got a mortgage, a, a credit card, and a current account with the same bank, well, you know, it's all in different systems and they want to put these aggregation layers on top so there's one place to go and actually maintain and retrieve that information. So Internet of Things, you know, a lot of people talking about wearables as something that's kind of trendy, but I actually think it's the industrial Internet of Things that is actually probably the place where this will break through first. A lot of traction with companies like GE. I know there's a lot of companies in Germany that do very similar things, particularly companies like Siemens. Um, oil pipeline monitoring, oil rig monitoring, monitoring train track infrastructure, where you, you have massive quantities of sensor data, and you need to monitor this sensor data. You need to do analytics against it, but you also need to take real-time decisions against it. If a particular set of sensors fire off, what do you do at that exact point in time? You need to decide what to do based on the fact that sensor's fired. So I think the Internet of Things, a lot of hype around in some trendy areas, but I actually think it's the industrial applications that will really uh, kind of push that forwards more. And then mobile, we talked about the fact that you know, that's a channel there that you know, has to be present for everybody now. A lot of mobile-first strategies. Content management. Catalogs is an interesting one. This is you know, the classic product catalog case. Um, I've worked a lot with Tesco's, who are a massive supermarket in the UK, so I think they're second in the world. And their product catalog has gone from a couple of years ago having a, about 100,000 items in it to within the next two years, they expect to have 10 million products that they'll sell. Um, and this goes from being perfectly manageable within an Oracle MDM type system to being completely unsuited to holding that. You can't serve a real-time web application out of Oracle if you want 10 million products with thousands and well, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people all hitting that. Um, and the real challenge is there are these big events, these big sale events. You know, if you have these Black Fridays, these post-Christmas sales, everybody wants to log on at the same time to get the best deals. And you need that scalable real-time performance system at the back end to be able to support that. And then just, just one or two more, well, maybe just jumping to the fraud detection piece, actually. I think this is a really nice example of where you have an analytical piece and a real-time piece that both have to cooperate together. As people are making transactions, say by credit card, could be trade data in the finance world, um, that data is being ingested, you're capturing that data, and you're doing analytics against it. And you're analyzing all that data to spot patterns, to spot trends, to fingerprint individual traders or individual credit card owners. But at the point somebody actually wants to transact, the point they put their credit card in the machine to put the pin in, the point that somebody says, can we complete this trade? There's a real-time decision that has to be made. You have to decide at that point in time, do we allow this transaction to proceed or do we cancel it and reject it? And you can't wait for analytical queries against petabytes of data to be processed to give you the result for that. So there's a combination of those two things going on together. Big, constant analytics going against your full data set and a real-time portion that's actually making a decision right now. So in tandem with this, there's a lot of changes going on in hardware. Um, it, it's not always you know, obvious at the surface level, um, but you know, the basic thing is the availability of cheap commodity servers that are very powerful. You know, we're pretty much moving away from you know, these big monolithic servers you know, where we might run large SMP systems on the likes of um, power Linux type systems or AIX and Solaris, they really are declining. They're still there, there's still big revenue for those firms, but very much declining and moving to clusters of commodity systems, which fits the cloud model very well. We also see the decreasing price of memory and increasing memory capacities. So the price of memory relative to the price of storage, storage has actually dropped pretty significantly. So we've got to the point now where actually, as long as you have a clustered system that can support it, you can put very large data sets in memory. Um, so there's a big customer of ours, Amadeus, based in, uh, well, they've got a big office in Erding, just up the road, 30 terabytes of data all in memory. Um, they have it persisted to disk as well. But because of the nature and changing nature of hardware, it's become possible to do that in a way that was never, just wasn't feasible before. Because 
you were based on a single individual box, one system, and you could only scale as large as that individual box was, would allow you to do. And I think the other change then is, is in terms of storage itself. So the introduction of SSDs has been one big driver, but we're starting to see, I think, a second wave in that SSD space, whereby we're seeing a move to PCI Express SSDs and SSDs that are local to the actual machines themselves. So I think we're definitely seeing a trend moving away from centralized SAN storage. Okay? And one of the drivers for this is a centralized SAN storage system simply can't keep pace with a rack or bank of PCI Express SSDs. You can't get the I.O. throughput on the front end, 10 gigabit Ethernet, um, 16 gigabit fiber channel. It's not enough. Okay? So we're seeing a move to moving that storage layer actually into the individual machines themselves. And I've got a few slides at the end that we can talk about that as well. So it's a case of how can we take advantage of these changing trends on the hardware and technology level to actually leverage them to solve the business problems of these massive quantities of data. And you know, certainly it requires the fundamental changes in the architecture at the database tier where the data is stored. And there's really two big technologies that are going on in this space. And in some ways, they have a lot of similarities. Um, one of them is NoSQL. That's the real-time interactive database side of things. That's certainly where Couchbase sits. And the other is in the batch-oriented analytical database side of things, which is really where Hadoop has got you know, massive traction. And in some ways, there's a lot of similarity. Both of these technologies are based on clusters of commodity hardware. They need individual cheap machines. You need more capacity. You need more performance. Just add more of them in. They both would prefer, though they can be run with SAN storage, they'd prefer local storage. You don't need a big box from, say, EMC or the likes of IBM. Get cheap disks, cheap SSDs, put them in the individual machines. So in many ways, they're taking advantage of those similar ideas and trends, but they're focused on slightly different targets. So Hadoop has this very, very throughput-oriented system that's very good for batch processing. So you hear these stories where people had their, their overnight batch processes in their traditional data warehouse systems, perhaps, and uh, you know, they've, they've moved to Hadoop, and they've gone from six hours, and now they can do it in four minutes, which is a, you know, a massive change, and, and people are very excited about that. But on the other side of that is the, the real-time piece, because four minutes, you can't wait four minutes for a web page to load. You can't, wait, you can't wait five seconds. It has to be millisecond or sub-millisecond times to get this data back. So we see these pattern of these two types of technologies being used in combination with each other, whereby there's this constant batch analytical process going on in Hadoop or related technologies, and then a real-time interactive piece going on in a NoSQL solution, a NoSQL database. So you have data being ingested in NoSQL, passed to Hadoop, analysis ongoing, the results of that analysis going back into the real-time database so that the results can be served up. So the classic example is somebody's browsing websites, you're capturing where they're going on the website, you're capturing what products they're looking at, you store that, you pass it off into Hadoop, you do all your trend spotting against that, publish the results back, and then the next time they hit the website, you can do the real-time portion of serving them different adverts, different products, based on the data that you've tracked on that left-hand side. So we, th these are some of the requirements that, that kind of drop out of these things. One is consistent performance at scale, the ability to handle very large peaks in traffic loads, um, big sale events in the gambling and gaming industries, big sporting events that affect the streaming and TV companies as well. You need scalability. You need the ability to grow the system as your user base grows and potentially shrink it as your user base grows. Certain you know, products will launch. They'll be very popular for a year or two. They might decrease in popularity, so you might want to shrink that service back down, cut your cost base, but still keep the existing user base on board. And then you need high availability. And you know, high availability in terms of, well, this is a clustered system. It's cheap boxes. Cheap, cheap boxes fail, especially on the cloud. You can't expect cloud boxes to be reliable. So you need an architecture that's designed to be reliable and fault tolerant in a software sense rather than a hardware sense. So protection from machine failures, protection from the loss of a complete rack of servers, and actually protection from the complete loss of a data center. So how do you replicate data between different geolocations to provide that? And then the fourth piece is around flexible data models. Um, so a, a traditional RDBMS has a, a fixed upfront schema. So you design your data model and then you lay out a schema into lots of different tables in your relational database. 
then when somebody comes along and says, we'd like these new features, we'd like them delivered in two weeks in your new iterative model where you want to do lots of very fast releases, you, you have kind of a headache there because now you have to manage this schema and constantly do these schema changes all the time. And that's a, that's a, that's a big headache for the DBAs. And unfortunately, it can become a bottleneck because um, it's not easy to manage that. So we talk about a flexible data model being JSON documents for us and for a number of people in this space. And that's... Um, you know, the natural way of storing data for the web. That's how web applications and mobile applications want to have their data. And the schema isn't defined up front. So the database doesn't have an explicit schema defined up front. If you want to add some new attributes, you just start storing them. You add them to the documents and you start storing them in the database. Now, that's not to say that there isn't actually structure to that data. It's just to say that it's, it's implicit. It's actually there um, by the application tier's responsibility rather than the database tier's responsibility. So this is now to move on to sort of the, the technical side of things a bit more. What, what does it actually mean under the hood to have an architecture that, that takes care of these things? And I said these, these have to be clustered systems, but specifically starting off looking at one node. What happens in one node? Nobody ever runs one node of Hadoop. Nobody ever runs one node of Couchbase or any NoSQL solution. But what's actually going on inside one of them? And you'll see that there's this kind of architecture. And this is actually you know, quite commonly seen in a few industries. Um, telecom, telco industry has had architectures quite like this for their big exchanges for a long time. What you see is sort of a control plane or a cluster manager. And this is responsible for coordination decisions. It's responsible for consensus and taking decisions about whereabouts uh, machines have failed, what should we do to recover from particular things. And then on the left-hand side, you see the data manager. So this is your I.O. path. This is where data is read and written. And one of the things that's key there is that there is an in-memory tier at the top. So there's a managed cache that can take advantage of the, these, <coughs> these increased memory capacities. And then at the bottom, there is the multi-threaded persistence engine, which has to be tuned in such a way that it can take advantage of the new storage technologies in terms of these local SSDs. And you know, in terms of what we do under the hood, well, there's different choices here as well. So the data manager side of things is in C and C++, because it's all about raw performance. It's about latency. It's about memory management. It's about sub-millisecond sub response times. The cluster manager is not really like that. It's just taking coordination decisions. So that's really about technologies like Erlang. Erlang's from, the, uh, from Ericsson. It's used for these big telephone exchange switches, like I mentioned. It's very, very suited for writing applications that require consensus and clustered solutions across many machines, although it's not necessarily suited to managing large quantities of data. So it's that split between the control plane and the data plane. So internally, you see these, these memory tiers right at the top. All data that is read and written is going through that in-memory caching tier. So you can see if you're reading a document and it's in the cache, it's just going to be served up out of the cache, that in-memory integrated cache. And this is something that traditionally in an RDBMS would probably have been a separate tier. So you may have well have had Oracle or DB2 or MySQL, and then you might have had a caching tier on top. That might have been uh, a product like Coherence, a product like Gemfire. It might have been there's other products like Hazelcast. And Redis, increasingly popular as a caching solution these days, that kind of hot in that area. Um, our heritage actually comes from Memcached, which has been a very, very popular one a few years ago. Um, and that's where some of our product heritage comes from. And that in-memory caching tier, instead of being a separate technology that you have to manage, instead of having to worry about where you place the data, is it in the, t the caching tier, is it in the database tier, how do I move it between the two? Those layers have been consolidated. You have one piece of technology to deploy. So essentially, you're deploying an integrated caching solution along with your database that manages that memory. And then as you see data being written in, you can see all data is being written into the memory tier. And it's being placed onto a replication queue, so it can be written out to other machines <coughs> in the cluster. Um, and it's being placed onto a disk queue, so it can be replicated and pushed down to disk. And again, there's some flexibility here, because you can actually choose if you really, really care about performance, to only wait for your data to have been written in memory, and you don't have to wait for it to get to disk. It will get to disk, but you don't have to wait for that to happen. So you can have a level of protection by ensuring your data has been written in memory on multiple machines within a cluster to offer a level of protection from machine failures, but still that top tier of performance. 
So you get the flexibility to choose where you want to sit in terms of having data that's only waiting for data to be written in memory, data that's waiting for it to be persisted to disk and so on, depending on the individual needs of particular operations within an application. So now we talk about, OK, that's one node of, of a NoSQL solution. What happens when you have multiple nodes as a solution? What happens when you actually have a clustered system? How is data distributed between these? Um, and we use a, a mechanism that's generally known as consistent hashing. So when you want to read a document into a data store like Couchbase, when you want to write a document into a data store like Couchbase, a lot of the smarts behind that are wrapped up within the SDKs. So the SDKs are things like Java, .NET, C, Python, Node.js, and so on. Um, so when you pass that request in saying, I'd like to read this document, it'll internally get hashed. And that hash identifies for us a unique shard, a unique partition within the database where that piece of data lives. And we maintain a mapping that shows for those partitions, whereabouts do they currently live within the cluster? And that's actually maintained by the client. So we push that data automatically to our clients. And what this means is that from a developer perspective, when you go and read and write a document, you don't see anything. It's transparent behind the scenes. But the SDK can actually calculate directly which machine in the cluster to go to to get a piece of data. So there's only ever one network round trip to go and get that piece of data. You're not going to a, a router. You're not doing some intermediate lookup to find a piece of data. You can go straight there and straight back again, which is massively beneficial when you talk about low latency applications because you can't be doing lots of network hops to get that data back. So what you see there then is an architecture that looks you know, something along these kind of lines. You see application servers at the top, and then you see a cluster of different machines all running the, the software, the NoSQL database. And you have a set of data that is the active set of data. So this is the, um, this is the set of data that you're modifying. And then there is the replica data. The replica data is actually, this is your spare copies of the data in case machines fail. This is your protection and fault tolerance provision. Um, so you're modifying and reading and writing the active data. That active data is evenly distributed throughout the machines in the cluster. In this example, there's three nodes in the cluster. So there's 30% of the data on each machine. If you actually had 10 machines in the cluster, well, you'd have 10% of the data on each machine actively being worked on. If you had 100 machines in the cluster, then you've only got 1% of the data set and 1% of the workload being handled by each machine. So this is the scale out kind of architecture, whereby as you add more machines, each machine is doing a smaller percentage of your total, total workload. So you get more performance and you get more capacity. So there's that, there's that even distribution of the data that's actively being worked on, that's being accessed via these SDKs. But there's also, very importantly, an even distribution of this replica data that you see down here at this layer. So again, with something like a, a MySQL, you might traditionally have had a, a model where you would have had an active database server, and then you would have had a hot spare, and you would have been replicating out to your hot spare that would have you know, fired up and become the master if your master failed in this kind of active passive scenario. This is quite different from that, because Every machine is actively serving write traffic. Every machine is reading and writing data. And every machine is also acting as a replica. But it's not a one-to-one -one, um, coupling between those, those relationships. So the data that lives on that server one is actually being replicated to evenly distributed across the other machines in the cluster. So if we take, say, partition five or shard five on server one, the replica copies for that might live on server two. But another alternative shard that lives on server one, the replica copies of that might live on server three. So we're taking the active data for each server, server, and every node in the cluster is actively acting as a replica for every other node in the cluster. Okay? So what this machine means is that if a machine fails, and for simplicity's sake, say you had a 10-node cluster, one machine dies, it disappears off the network, the power's gone then the other nine machines in the cluster, they're already connected to your clients, and they just have 5 or 10% extra work to do. You're not doing this big failover to your slave where everybody has to connect. Um, and you can add and remove machines as a fully online operation because of that. You can move these shards between data. You can do online maintenance to grow the cluster. You can shrink the cluster. You can take machines out to do security patches. And this data can be shuffled, and those replicas allow you to maintain that availability of the data and even even though the application tier doesn't see any of those changes ongoing. 
So you see each V bucket, each shard replicated between machines. And you have this cluster map, which provides location of which server shards are on. And you say read, write, and update operations. They're always going to the same node for a given key. So you have consistent access to your data. So it's not an eventually consistent system for people who are kind of familiar with NoSQL already. OK. So this is your mechanism for, for providing availability from machine failures, one machine, two machines, three machines. Um, you can also provide you know, uh, mechanisms for protecting from rack failures with rack zones and so on. But I think more interesting is actually the case of how to provide availability between data centers. And this is all about memory-to-memory -memory replication. We talk about memory-first architectures as data is being written into memory on one side. As soon as it's written into memory, you want to be pushing that data out to your remote site because that gives you the lowest time gap before it gets that extra availability and protection of being at a different location. So this provides you your high availability, but actually it's very, very commonly used for a different reason, which is geolocality of data. Um, so in these global operations where your users may be distributed all over the world. You don't want your users who are over in the US having to traverse all the way back to a data center in Germany every time they want to access um, their user profile, every time they want to view the product catalog. So you can build up these systems and have data replicated geographically so that it's close and near to the end users. And we see this very commonly with some very big firms. And they have the West Coast data center, the East Coast data center, the European data center the Asian data center, and they replicate the data between all of these. And when you're in Europe, you'll be accessing probably their Dublin data center or somewhere in Cork in Ireland. But if you go to the US, you'll be accessing your same data in the local data center. So you're always getting that latency and experience of accessing that data without having to traverse across continents. And that comes back to people have this expectation of interactive applications that respond quickly. They don't want to wait to go across continents to get that data back and for that page to load to make that booking. OK, so this is you know, flexible data models. You have a different way of structuring your data. You don't have a schema defining what it looks like up front. So how do you access it? How do you query that data if you don't really have a readily upfront defined schema? And in terms of you know, Couchbase's approach to this, we certainly think that um, from the NoSQL perspective, it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, you know, when people talk about NoSQL, what they're really meaning is there's alternative to an RDBMS. There are situations where RDBMSs like MySQL and Oracle are absolutely the right solution, very many situations where they are. Um, but there are situations where an alternative cluster data store might be appropriate. But we do feel that NoSQL is a bit of a misnomer because we think that actually the SQL piece of your relational database is actually a very, very good interface for querying data. It's one of the few languages from the sort of the 1970s along with C that's still around and still heavily used today. Uh, and the reason for that really is that it, it, it's a very well-designed language. It's a really nice balance between being readable and being manageable and understandable, but being low-level enough that it can actually provide very high performance. The trouble with SQL is that it's not suited to unstructured data, and it's not suited to document databases that deal with sort of JSON data. Because it's designed for flat tabular data, it really doesn't work well for hierarchical data that has structure to it. So what we have is a query language that we've introduced called NICL, N1QL, um, which comes from the idea that it's a non-first normal form query language because it's not flat tabula tabular data. But it's a superset of SQL. So it's ANSI 92 SQL compliant in that sense, but it's been extended with this additional notation. So what you see here is you see your standard select statements, but you also see that it has an array notation. It has a dot notation. So if somebody has a user profile, you might want to do um, select from user profiles where name equals Tom, but you're going to select um, address dot first line dot house number. So you're actually indexing within the record just to pull out their house number. Or maybe you're indexing to pull out the address, or you want to pull out some piece of contact information, um, you know, the expiry date of their credit card even, for, for instance. So you have structure within that record, and you have a query language which, which supports interfacing and interacting with that structure. So it's SQL compliant, has the benefit of people being able to adopt it very quickly. You know, the pool of skills out there in SQL is, is massive. Anyone who works with databases is familiar with SQL without a doubt. So they can adopt and get used to using this new technology without having that barrier to entry. 
because it's really an extension and building on top of that pre-existing um, concepts. So the other thing is, you know, this really is very much in line with fully featured in terms of where the SQL language is. Certainly just specifically on Couchbase side, we're using it as a query language currently. Data updates using SQL interfaces will come a little bit later in the future. Um, it's something we're working on, but currently it's really about the query side of things, the access to the data. So it's things like your select statements, distincts, um, where's, group by clauses, order by clauses, limits and offsets, um, and in particular joins. So joining records is something that's perhaps a little unusual in a NoSQL database. It's not supported by the majority of them, but it's certainly something we feel is a, a, a big important thing. It may not be in a NoSQL database the key thing you want to be doing all the time um, for reasons to do with the data modeling. But the situations where you would really like to take two different data sets, customers use a profile and their set of orders, and you really would like to join them together. Um, so that's a, a, a big thing for us, I think, if, you know, on the Couchbase side. And then there's all sort of other operators, arithmetic operators, scalar operators. These are all exactly the kind of things you'd expect in a, in a, a SQL interface, subqueries and things. And then there's a, a few extensions. These are really additional things that support the fact that this is hierarchical data. So nest and unnest, these are methodologies for actually sort of querying within a document and bringing data together from within a document. Um, itself, not just across documents. So we talk about several different kinds of access. We talk about key value access, sub-millisecond, high performance access. I know the username of the person who's just logged in, so I can pull back their user profile straight away. I don't have to do a query to do that. So you get these sub-millisecond performance. Then we talk about the SQL style interface for the querying of data um, and access to metadata. And this actually itself, this query capability requires quite a different architecture because it's a clustered system again. It needs to be suited to a cloud type solution. So we see these set of services and these services can dynamically be moved around within the cluster. So you have a, a data service that's responsible for storing the data, unsurprisingly. It's also responsible for the reading and writing of key value access to the data. So these nodes, these systems will have the actual disk storage that has your data and it will be serving up the read-write traffic. Then you have an index service and capability. Um, the data service, these are probably cheap standard servers. Maybe you might have 32 gig machines, some cores, some good network bandwidth and decent, decent storage speed underneath them. Index services is quite different. One of the challenges with indexes, a secondary indexes on a database, is actually how do, you, how do you manage data access when you want to ask a question that goes across the whole data set? You know, when you want to ask a, a question about an individual user, that's pretty easy. But when you want to say, well, tell me for all users, what was the most popular product search this week? What was the most popular product flight search on our flight system, inventory system in the last week? That's the kind of question which um, requires information about all data. But as these systems get larger and larger, your data is spread across more and more nodes for scalability. So in a traditional kind of clustered system, what you see is a scatter gather process. You push the request out. Every machine in the cluster does some subset of the work. They send their results back. It gets collated and it gets responded back to the client. So you see this scatter gather process. The difficulty with the scatter gather process is that as the number of machines increases, the cost of sending that data out having all the collation to bring it back together actually becomes quite a big overhead. And your, your response time is always bound by the slowest machine to respond. And as you have hundreds and hundreds of machines potentially, you know, it's guaranteed that one of them is going to be slow to respond because it's on the cloud and you know, Amazon didn't schedule it to run when you expected it to. Um, so it becomes a problem in terms of actually maintaining consistent performance. So indexes, they don't naturally scale well across many machines. So what we're suggesting here is a, a quite a different architecture whereby your indexes are actually maintained on as few machines as possible. Okay? So you distribute them across machines, but you try to keep it to a small number of machines and actually have this mixed environment where you are both scaling out and scaling up. So your index nodes might use quite different hardware. These might be 256 gigabytes of memory, 
maybe even, you know, if it's not on the cloud, there could be a terabyte of memory in these machines, much, much larger machines that actually maintain the index for the full data set across the system. So that now means when you come to query and you see the query service on the far, far side, it doesn't have to go out to 100 machines to ask for all the results that match. It goes to the index service. The index service is the one location where it can back, get back the matching results and then pull back the appropriate records that it needs to to service that request. So you see this heterogeneous architecture whereby you have linear scalability for your data nodes and then you have a scale out architecture for your indexes but actually trying to think about well actually for these because of the very fundamental nature of indexes is it better to scale them up as well as out. And this, this has advantages as well in terms of workload isolation because if you think about the query service um, if somebody runs some completely crazy ad hoc query that requires so much computation that's going to be a drain on the other system resources, you've got quite nice isolation because that's only going to affect one query service and one index service. The rest of your system can keep processing and keep on going while you sort that out. Okay, so this is, this is within the query node, what's going on. While there's certain parts of querying that are very parallelizable, um, fetches, joins, filters, sorting. There's other parts of it which are, you know, somewhat difficult to parallelize, you know, limiting the results. Until you've actually calculated your results and sorted them, it's hard to limit and get the first 10 of them because you have to sort them first to do it. So this is kind of showing which parts internally will be spread out and be very multi-core oriented and which ones are probably actually better off just being run on a single thread because of the cost of going across many cores isn't, it isn't worth the effort. You're better off sticking with a single thread of the solution. And you can see the requests there. This is where it goes out to index services and out to data services to retrieve information. So this is kind of the architecture on the query side of things. And then obviously at the bottom, there's the storage tier. At the end of the day, no matter how much data you try to keep in memory and how memory optimized you try to be, if you're writing large quantities of data in, at the end of the day, it's always going to be bottlenecked by your storage bandwidth at the bottom. Eventually, you can't write more data in than you've got storage in bandwidth at the bottom of your stack. And this is where a lot of changes have been coming in as well. We talked about uh, hard disks, the move to SSDs, and now we're seeing the move to PCI Express SSDs. So this is SSDs that actually sit on the bus where a graphics card might have sat traditionally. And what we've seen that, you know, the, the big vendors, we've been working closely with Intel on this, is the actual software stack sitting between your application and your storage sitting on this PCI Express bus is quite big now. It was designed for SAS, it was designed for SATA, it was designed for talking to SAN storage that lives somewhere out on the network. And there's quite a lot of latency involved with that. So there's been these development of these new technologies and these new protocols who are actually better suited to that kind of an operation. So in particular, there's one called NVM Express. So that's a new protocol for talking to SSDs that's standardized with all, within all the new Intel chipsets um, and all the motherboards and machines, and it dramatically reduces the latency. So you know, when going from six gig SAS to 12 gig SAS, well, we talked about latency being reduced, but you know, NVMe is more than 200 microseconds lower latency than even the very latest, greatest SAS technology that's only just coming into play. So very, very good from a latency perspective. That's just relative latency between SAS and NVMe. And we've recognized that because of these changes at the storage layer, we need a storage technology that can take advantage of this. So there's ForestDB. Um, if anybody used to work with MySQL, they used to talk about InnoDB versus MyISAM. This is the core part of our database, really, you could consider. Uh, ForestDB is somewhat equivalent to that. So it's KV storage engine. Um, and it, and it has to take advantage of these new SSD technologies. So it needs to be um, optimized for SSDs. It needs to adapt to the fact that SSDs have this flash transition layer. So SSDs have their own metadata um, that, you know, when you store data in an SSD and you think it's stored in this block here, it's not really. The SSD is shuffling them behind the scenes to do wear leveling to maintain the performance for you. And it needs to make the base of I.O. libraries, can't be blocking I.O. because you need much higher throughput, much higher bandwidth for interacting with these, with these kind of systems because uh, they have so much capacity available. So this is a throughput comparison, you know, um, using ForestDB and comparing some of these different storage technologies that have come along. On the left-hand side in blue, there's hard disks, which you can hardly see because the throughput on hard disks is tiny. But then you can see SSDs using a SATA interface fast, a heck of a lot faster than what we could do with hard disks before. 
well, then you see there's actually a pretty significant increase, not by changing the, the, the SSD itself, but by changing the protocols that are being used to communicate with it. So big increases in throughput, and also big decreases in latency. Um, so going from, you know, sort of uh, 260, 280 milliseconds of lat microseconds of latency, taking that down further. Sorry, that is milliseconds of latency there. I don't believe that's milliseconds. I think that's wrong. I think that's microseconds for the record. There's no way they're taking 200 milliseconds down at the SSD layer. Yeah. So comparing to SATA, NVMe provides, well, 50% increase in read-write throughput and a 40% improvement on read-write latency. So that's kind of the comparison there from a throughput side of things. And you can see the write throughput is massive. And this is a highly parallelized test. Because of the way this new protocol works, much larger queue depth, the par potential for parallelization is much, much higher. So what we see here is these kind of technologies all coming together for these real-time big data applications where they must be interactive, they must be high performance, they need these fast response times. So we bring the pieces together, these new business demands for processing and serving real-time sub-millisecond latency, for monitoring what people are doing, for working out how best to serve up data to them. But it must be coupled with long-term analytical insight, and this is where the other big tech data technologies like Hadoop come in. And in order to be able to serve up these kind of workloads, we need to take advantage of architectures that can scale and deliver consistent performance, and they need to take advantage of the latest trends in hardware. So that means local storage, fast SSDs, commodity hardware, increases in memory capacity, and really all of that plays very closely into the cloud environments where these applications tend to be increasingly getting deployed. Okay, so I don't know, we've got a, a couple of minutes just left for any questions, um, uh, any kind of areas where people are wondering, you know, what specific kinds of use cases is this kind of technology well suited to? What kind of things is it not suited to? Um, I think now's a good time to pause. If there's any questions, uh, let me know. Yeah. Nice. Sorry. You were, you were showing um, all, the um, all the new possibilities in terms of hardware and the storage of space and disk and yeah. all that. Um, how do your customers cope with the network side of things, especially when we're talking about geographically redundant yeah. uh, uh, infrastructure? Yeah. So the majority of customers still run on gigabit Ethernet. Um, I would say there's outliers. Uh, Amadeus is a good example. They, they, they've gone 10 gig very heavily. Um, it varies from customer to customer in terms of cross data center links. And that's why we have a different replication technology between machines versus between data centers. It's a different code base because when you talk about data centers, you have to expect the link's going to be lossy. It's going to lose much more higher packet error rates. It's going to go down sometimes. It might go down for hours or days sometimes if you, you know, you're very cost sensitive and you can't afford the top tier telco provider. Um, solutions. So it's a different technology that is provided to have the expectation of those higher re error rates. Um, but it's a challenge for some people. Um, you know, there's, I know there's one of our, our biggest customers, they have their own private fiber optic network all around the world. It's great for them. They don't have to worry about any of those problems. But the rest of us, you know, we don't get that benefit. So we need to, you know, think about that and, and keep it in mind. So generally speaking, it is still gigabit ethernet for most people. Um, and the clustered system helps in that sense because if you have gigabit ethernet on 10 machines, you now have 10 gigabit of throughput without having to the cost of going to that 10 gigabit kind of layer at the top. Yeah. Does that kind of answer the question or is there some a kind of different angle you're coming from? Hmm? If you're dispersing geographically, there's different considerations to take into account. So you, you do your best there in terms of can we compress the data before sending it? Can the data be deduplicated before you send it across the wire? So you try and minimize what you send. But you're right, at some point at the end of the day, you have to say, the data coming in, does it fit down the pipe to go to the remote site? And you know, there's a limitation there at the end of the day. Uh, we do see uh, increasing demand for subsets of data to be pushed to different locations. So maybe you might have a central system, but then individual airlines, for example, Lufthansa want their data pushed to them, but they don't care about British Airways data. So you'll just replicate 
subsets of the data to different people. That, that helps in regulatory environments as well. I know particularly in Germany, there's a lot of concerns about personal sensitive data being pushed to, to different locations, especially the US. So you might only want to push subsets of the data out to the US anyway for regulatory reasons as well. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know how we're doing for time. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can wrap up. And, uh, yeah. One, uh, what kind of guarantees do you make with, data, with respect to data safety and yeah. consistency when one server goes down? Yeah. So the question is around what kind of guarantees are there with respect to data safety and data consistency? So in terms of consistency, Couchbase is a, a consistent database. So if one user writes a piece of data in and another app server, immediately that exact, exact microsecond tries to read it back, they'll get the answer that was just written. So they're not going to get a stale answer for that piece of data. But in terms of the guarantees for the availability and the durability of the data, the kind of acid type guarantees, it's actually kind of flexible. So we put the choice in the application developer's hands here. Okay? So even within one application, we have, see people where some data, they'll write it into memory on one machine. It will get replicated to other machines, and it will go to disk, but they're not going to wait. Okay? So the easiest example of this is like Facebook likes. You know what? It's high performance, it's high throughput. If we lost one like, well, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know? um, and there's a lot of applications that are like, you know, they, they are in that kind of nature. But if somebody's just come to Facebook, they filled in the big form saying, this is my new user profile, this is my name, this is my address, that's critical data. Your customer spent few, a few minutes creating that. You're going to want for that to be written to disk. You're going to want, it doesn't matter if it takes you, uh, you know, an extra 50 milliseconds to write it to disk. It's okay. It's a, it's a lower throughput operation. It's a lower bandwidth operation. And for that, you will, we will want to wait and get the better guarantee. So you have the choice, even within one application, to be flexible on those guarantees and move from maximum performance, but with lowest guarantee of the availability and durability of the data. And you can move up a few notches up piece by piece where you're de decreasing the guarantee that you can provide you're, sorry, you're increasing the guarantee that you can provide for the availability and the durability, but you are decreasing the performance naturally because you're going from memory now talking about disk performances. So, uh, this, um, can I request for having at least three or five copies being written to disk to have a real guarantee? Yeah. Data? Yeah, so in our sense, we would limit three additional copies. So you would have your active copy plus three additional copies. So that would essentially give you a copy on four machines four separate physical machines or virtual machines um, would be kind of the upper limit. Um, and you know, this plays in a little bit to the traditional ideas that used to be there with RAID disk storage. As you increase the number of machines in your cluster, the probability of two machines failing at the same time starts to increase. You've got three nodes, the probability of two breaking together is pretty low. You've got 100 machines, the probability of two breaking at the same time is quite high. So you tend to increase the number of copies as the um, number of machines in the cluster increases. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe one more question, or do we need to wrap up? No, one more question. Um, you talked about uh, Nickel yeah. um, as a query language and uh, data manipulation language later on. Um, do you see um, large migrations of traditional SQL databases into a couch-based So interestingly, I would say for the migrations of large-scale SQL databases, um, those that had the most demand to move off an RDBMS already had caching layers in front. Okay? So they were already, some years ago, had had to put an in-memory separate tier on top. So they, they had already moved away from SQL, in a sense. They'd already moved to key-value type operations. So the people... And they were the people who had the biggest challenges because they were the people who had the biggest performance requirements, like Amadeus in particular. So they actually tend to use the key value access. So the early adopters who are kind of coming in and who've been there and they've moved across, they were already kind of in memory. What they've done is kind of a, a simplification of taking the in-memory tier and the database tier, collapsing them together, and cost savings on Oracle side too, of course, as well, um, and bringing it into one space. But they, they're often not so much thinking on the query side as key value because they need often sub-millisecond latency. No matter how good, you know, how amazing you think your query language is, fundamentally, a query can never be quite as fast as looking something up by a unique ID. 
Um, so that we still see a lot of people trying to go down the unique ID, kind of look up key value access um, for the most performant path, and then using the query capabilities alongside that, often for, say, customer service type solutions. Somebody rings up customer service, and they've forgotten their username, or you know, that's where the query capabilities really come in. Lower throughput, latency is not as important. Somebody's on the phone, if it takes you know, a few hundred milliseconds, maybe a second or two even to return, it's OK. You know, it's, not, it's a different kind of situation. So the, the slightly different you know, balance between those things. Yeah. Okay. Right. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much.